stage, Kylie Kia and Leslie Jameson. of your life with your mother, Lisa Marie Presley, but also your mother's book that she'd started and she wanted to complete before she sadly passed away. At any point during this process of making this, did you think, I don't want to do this anymore, I don't want to write this book? <laughs> yeah, um, often. Um, it was very emotional, so I would kind of complete a chapter and then put off doing the next one. Um, so it was kind of a slow process because it was, you know, and I would when I would finish one, I wouldn't necessarily want to go in and read it again, unless it was like the earlier chapters are very funny and fun. Um, but the later chapters, I would find myself writing them and then not wanting to reread them because it was just felt so intense, which is interesting for me because I've written, but I've never written about myself, so or my family or anything so personal, so. Um, I was trying to approach it as like a task and as like a piece of work that I was having to do, but it was also very emotional. I imagine, and I'm sure that everybody here tonight thinks they probably know some of your family history, but this is more than I ever knew before for sure. Um, but it's clearly such an emotional story as well. When you're writing it, that was one thing, and you kind of explain in the book the process of there were tapes that Lisa Marie had recorded in the sort of starting the process to write the book uh, that you would listen to, and you had to listen to them lying down. Is that correct? Um, I didn't have to lie down, <laughs> but I was lying down. <laughs> um, I just was, it was before I was going to sleep and I was in my bed, so um, I put them on my headphones and listened to them. And, I, I do write the book that like, I know that grief makes me feel happy, so I think that lying down, I think, felt like a safe place to be. Um, but yeah, it was, it was difficult to listen to, but then it became very like funny, because my mom was so wild um, and funny, um, and the stories were kind of, hilarious and the way she talks in the tapes is very like she's she has a sense of humor about most everything even when it gets heavier you know of course there's moments where she's not being funny but a, a, a lot of the tapes she's kind of uh, a bit cheeky so so I was uh, I was laughing a lot throughout it which is a good thing yeah. um, but as you say like a lot of it deals with some very sad subjects and it's one thing to listen to the tapes and to write that book and to have some sort of control around the environment and how you do that but just on a kind of personal level how have you found doing events like this and, and launching the book and, and talking about it are you taking care of yourself in that as well i don't know how to take care of myself other than to sleep well and eat but i'm doing those things um i think that there's something about this that felt very daunting but i also think that sharing like uh personal stories with people um can be like cathartic in a way for for and truth you know i think that so much of why people write stories or books or make films or write songs is to share like lived experiences and connect with people and this was actually very similar and um so i think that there's something about like being totally honest about your life and, and sharing sharing things that is, um, I don't know, that makes you feel more connected with people. Yeah. Would you say as well that you're the copa in your family? I think people take different roles in, in their families, but it strikes me like you're the copa. The copa? Who is that? So like kind of the person who is a bit of the 
glue holds things together, the one that kind of oh, lands like the responsible yeah. one. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Which can be a blessing and a curse, right? Yeah. I mean, to, for it's, it's funny, because I'm not like the most responsible person in the world. Um, but I kind of, I would say in my family, um, I think I was just uh, maybe a bit of a control freak or something. <laughs> Well, that brings me nicely onto their, uh, I mean, there's so much, I'm, I'm very wary that I don't want to spoil the reading experience for everyone who's going to dive into this story, but there are various themes that come out throughout the book. And one of those is that sort of notion of freedom and control from your mother's life. And, you know, obviously growing up as Elvis Presley's daughter, there's a huge amount of freedom in that. Um, but as a kid, that was quite challenging for her as well. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about the sort of lifestyle that she grew up around and, and how that was for her as a child? So it's quite remarkable reading about that. Well, I think that she had a very unique circumstance where she was Elvis's daughter um, and she grew up at Graceland. And when she was there, there weren't really rules and she was kind of like the queen of Graceland. <laughs> when she was, you know, three, four, five. <laughs> um, and she was, you know, kind of a little bit of a tyrant, I think. Um, but she just really loved the freedom she had there and she would drive around on her golf carts and boss everybody around and fire people, try to fire people. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then I think when she would go home to her mother's house, it was a much more scheduled, you know, probably more normal, routine life um that she hated that yeah. i mean it's it's a difficult thing with you know living in two different families for a start but also kind of the notion of safety and danger when you're a child as well um there's one particular story that resonated with me because it just seems so remarkable but it's true uh, could you tell us about the time that she really wanted to go ride roller coasters with her dad but the kind of how fun but also terrifying that was well, because the gun thing? Um, I mean, it's very American. <laughs> I think you guys are more scared than Americans. Um, yeah, he, he took her to, you know, the, the amusement park in, in Memphis, and um, they would ride on the roller coasters. Like, he loved roller coasters, she loved roller coasters, and he took her, um, and he rode the roller coaster, and he had his hand on, I think she says he had, like, one hand on the, the thing in the other hand on his like gun in his pocket. <laughs> um, but she was, she didn't tell it like as if she was afraid. She no. just said, you know, that scene, I know that sounds crazy, but it was the South and you know, that's just how it was. How it was, <laughs> yeah. Um, and also with that sort of not people saying no to her, the, the sort of consequences that come with that as well when you're so little to, um, you know, you're a mother yourself now, like can you imagine if you just let your kid do anything they ever wanted to do? I think it came from a place of wanting to make her happy. And I think that he really liked to um, like kind of create these, or, or, or like he loved like grand gestures and giving people gifts and making people happy and surprising people. And so I think it was coming from that sort of place with him of just wanting her to have everything she wanted. I don't know, you know, but she definitely was like, a little spoiled and bossy <laughs> but you know i think she was aware of it yeah again like you've, you've said it already but there is so much humor in this book as well and her wit comes across really beautifully but that kind of notion of she sort of swings from like freedom and control quite dramatically and i'm very british so i'm quite squeamish about intimacy at the best of times but uh, again there's a story where your mum recounts how you were conceived which I think most people don't really know or want to know the full story of well, their conception, but you now do. Yeah, I knew, I know, I already knew it before. You know, I didn't know the details of it, but I, I knew that it was, you know, on the ship, and I knew that she had planned to have me and didn't totally tell my dad, um, <laughs> which she told me about. And then for some reason in the book, she kind of goes, well, I didn't totally mean to trap him, and then, but we, she always told everyone she did mean to trap him, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, she, she, uh, 
was with my dad on a ship in the Bahamas and and planned to get pregnant. So she's like kind of by herself. The <laughs> and everything. Yeah. She was, yeah. On her own. <laughs> and then told him later <laughs> when it worked. <laughs> Yeah, well, it seems like a good time to talk about your dad as well, yeah. because he's a constant, obviously, throughout this story as well. And, you know, he was there, even though he wasn't uh, married to your mum for an, her entire life, he was always a constant presence in your yeah. life. Like, how has he been involved in this process of, of telling this story? What's really amazing is that um, he lived with my mom while she was doing a lot of these interviews. So there were moments in the audio where I'd listen and she would say to the guy she was talking to, um, you know, like, hold on a second, I'm just gonna ask Danny, because he was in the house. So I would hear my dad come in on the tape and then I would kind of like bicker over how something happened. And so it was, it was pretty funny. And then when I started writing it, because um, we're, you know, we see each other, we live five minutes from each other, so he's over at my house a lot. I kind of did the same thing where I'd be writing and go like, wait, so where did this happen and what, you know, so he was there to kind of uh, help me because I was filling in a lot of, I have, I have a pretty good memory, but he helped me fill in a lot of the details um, that I didn't remember because I was not alive or, <laughs> or six or seven. It does sound like there was so much that was shared between you and your mom. She was very open, it seems with her kids, but was there anything in particular that you can remember when you were listening, lying in your bed with your mom's voice in your ears, that you were like, huh, okay. No, I just like laughed so much. And that was something that I really like valued and cherished is that how fun, how, like she was so funny. Um, and that's really it. I mean, we were so close that there wasn't really anything in the tapes that I hadn't heard before, which, you know, is, uh, you know, we didn't have like a lot of boundaries in our family. So, um, I mean, I knew, I knew most things about her. She knew kind of everything about me, my dad, my brother, we were very close. Which probably explains maybe a bit about how going into this process then, there weren't any huge surprises that you were going to be shocked by necessarily. Yeah, I think that she felt more comfortable with me than she would, than she did with the guy she was talking to in the interview, so I think I think I, she would have told me if there was like a bomb she was gonna drop on this guy. <laughs> I think. So the timing of it though, so again, the book opens um, and it's a really gripping opening because you talk about how you explain the process. So throughout the book, there's different fonts and there's different uh, styles of writing between the, the tapes that, and your mother's voice and then your own sort of filling in the gaps along the way. But you say about how this has been quite a long time coming for your mum and she wanted to write this book and but she was quite insecure about why and how and, and what that was going to be like and so she came to you to say can you help me write it when she was alive and you're like yeah sure like not kind of knowing what the commitment would be but then she died a month after she asked you so what did you feel at that I mean it's obviously not the first thing in your mind when that happens but the, the sort of weight of the promise you made yeah. um the first thing that the first way that I felt was like I I'm sure people in here have experienced loss and grief, but like when someone you love dies, there's a lot of things to do, um, or things that aren't gonna finish. And so I was kind of in that headspace of kind of help, like trying to tie up loose ends and figure, and there were things she was in the middle of, like, so that was kind of where the book began, is I was like, oh God, this book that she was writing. Um, and I, I, it wasn't, it wasn't something that I necessarily like wanted to do because I was I just lost my mom and it felt like really daunting. But um, I just kind of found myself putting things in order, I guess. And the book was felt like this big thing that I was like, okay, I know I, I know that I have to finish this for her. And that um, so at the beginning it was kind of like I was a bit um, apprehensive about it, but then. As I began, as I did, like there was a first draft, and, and we were going through it, and I was talking to the publisher. Like it actually became really fun um, and joyful, and I felt like very um, happy that I was doing it. Because there there were moments where I was like, why am I doing this? But really, it was also the whole time it was just for her, you know. Like I this isn't I, I'm not really. It's funny I, I wouldn't have 
thought I would ever be someone to write a, you know, a book. And now, but now that I've done this, I, I get the appeal. Like it was a very, very fun process, but it was a little bit out of my comfort zone um, to kind of do this and then be the face of her book and go around talking about her life, you know, just because I'm, I'm not her. And I don't know, I felt a little bit, I guess, uh, yeah, apprehensive about it, but then it ended up being this thing that was just really beautiful, I think. And I mean, I know it's early days yet, but the reaction that people have had to it, and I think whenever you're talking about grief on that level as well, people often share their stories of grief with you. Have you felt a lot of that through social media and through meeting people, and has that felt overwhelming, or has it been a pleasant byproduct of this? I think it's the, the best byproduct because that's sort of why my mom wanted to write a book. Um, she wanted to share her her whole life story because it's kind of wild, but also as a human being, she wanted to share her um, what she went through with addiction and, and grief and loss. Um, and I think that she and the in the audio tapes and in the, on the tapes often would say, like, if I can just make people feel a little bit less alone or feel like I helped somebody um, not feel so alone in, in whatever experience they're going through, like that's why I wanna do this, you know? Um, so that's like my favorite part is, cause I know that would have been her, what she loved about it is, is people connect reading, it, cause you know, it's very candid and very open and raw and, She's not like, she's she's such an honest person that um, it's, you know, it's a very honest experience of grief and addiction. And she, she kind of, everything's in there, you know? And I think that for me, the way that I've gotten through hard times in my life or grief um, have been by connecting, like knowing that other people around me in the room have also gone, you know, are also experienced that feeling. So I, I think that, that that's um, why she wanted to write it entirely. Yeah, and I guess to, to try and get that connection with people, you have to be completely honest and candid. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, there are some bits when I was reading this book where I wanted to look away from the page because it's so, it's so blunt and frank, the way that she writes sometimes. Um, so just one of those moments where she talks about her drug addiction, which didn't come for her, she says, until she was 40, which I'm not sure is something that a lot of people have quite realized that it was quite late on in her life after the birth of your twin sisters. Um, but the opening of one of the chapters is just talking about the addiction she had to the prescription medication she'd been given for that birth, saying that it escalated to 80 pills a day, which is almost inconceivable to think about. I know, I can't believe, you know, she was a really tough, <laughs> I don't even know how she survived that, to be honest. Um, but it's a strange story, the like later in life addiction, but I think it's actually a lot more common than you would think. Um, and opiates are extremely addictive. Um, it's, I mean, it's a huge problem in America. Um, now there's more like regulations and it's a little bit harder, but um, it's, it's extremely hard to, to be in opiate addiction. And, and she did, you know, and that's something I like to also remind people is she she did get through her addiction, which I don't think we anticipated because it was so intense. And like you said, she was taking so many pills. Um, but she was able to, to beat it, which is also can be uncommon, you know? Do you have a lot of anger about that as well? Just the fact that she was able to get hold of that much medication? I, I guess a lot of that comes with if you have the money, then, it's easier. Definitely, I mean, it's um, definitely when you are like a celebrity, there are rules that are bent a bit, I think. And uh, there were moments where I, you know, I say in the book that I would call doctors and, and try and convince them otherwise, but she was, you know, she was Lisa Marie Presley and they would listen to her. So I think maybe that's a pretty, you know, common story. And, and addiction and fame and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, still doesn't make it any easier when that's your mother. <laughs> You're no. having to, again, one of the, there are some, it's kind of, a, it's a really sad story, but there's so much humor in you relay like text 
conversations that you would have with her at certain times as well when she was really desperate and how did you feel about kind of putting that side of the, the story in from the real personal accounts of how it was for you dealing with some of those things? Um, I didn't want to at first and then I had this like moment where I felt I was just sitting alone and I felt that she wanted me to include my perspective. I don't know how to, because I was, I, I was kind of like, I couldn't decide how much I should share that wasn't from her mouth, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and then I just, I would just go back to who she was and what she would have wanted. And um, she was just, I mean, she was like so honest that I don't think she would have, I think that, that she would have wanted me to share, you know, exactly what happened. And um, yeah. On the flip side of that honesty, sort of as you know, a teenager who's grown up with a mom as well, like how honest would she be, like about things like your outfits when you like, you know, you're just the kind of stuff that people might have all experienced with their own mothers. I mean, she was like very. She cared about manners a lot. Um, I think she got that from her mom. She definitely like would care if we were, you know, if I had my feet on a coffee table, like that kind of a thing. Um, you know, always tell me to wear a bra. <laughs> um, um, always, my whole life. Um, the kind of refrain of Riley. It's in my head oh. still. <laughs> um, but she, yeah. So that she was, she was, she was pretty. Um, I don't want to say like controlling, but we had a lot of rules. Um, we didn't have. It, it's funny because we had a, a lot of freedom. Like I say in the book, if we went to school some days and we didn't want to, she would just let us skip, you know? So um, there was freedom there, but with like curfew and rules and, and those sorts of things, like she was actually quite strict. Um, we had to be home and, you know, I, I was never allowed to stay out as late as my friends. There always had to be a parent there. She had to go and check, you know? So she was quite um, strict with that kind of stuff. And like our food, like we couldn't, I couldn't drink Coca-Cola when I was like 17. <laughs> and I smoked cigarettes back then. And I remember being like, what? This is so crazy. Um, you should let you smoke cigarettes yeah, before like, she was like, <laughs> she was like, sugar, you can't drink sugar. I don't know. There was like, so she had rules, but they were, you know, yeah. random. <laughs> so is, is there anything that, that kind of pops into your head about, would she come and kind of drag you out of a party if you'd like miss curfew, that kind of thing? No, but she would, like, if we, if anyone ever um, was mean to us, she would walk onto the schoolyard and, and uh, like, regulate the situation, <laughs> which was very embarrassing. <laughs> how, how exactly would she regulate it? I mean, she would go to the kid and, like, get mad at them. I was terrible. I'm like, she, most kids were afraid of my mom. <laughs> And most of my friends growing up were afraid of her and wouldn't like would come through the kitchen and not say anything and just go to, <laughs> go to my room. Um, but she really would appreciate the ones who did talk to her because um, she was, yeah, she was intimidating. But it was it was it was because she was just so um, she didn't have the ability to like uh, small talk or like pretend she wasn't feeling how she felt. So I think her honesty made people uncomfortable. Yeah. But to me, it was always just funny. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to have been in that playground, yeah. I got to admit. <laughs> um, but you, again, you say in the book that naturally your mum was a split between her dad and her mum, so mm -hmm. Priscilla Presley as well. And I know that um, a few nights ago you did an event at Graceland's with Priscilla. How involved has she been in this process of, of getting this book out there and what's her reaction been to it? Um, she hasn't been involved at all with the the writing process or anything. I just it was something I did by myself. I actually hadn't shown anyone the book until it came out um, because the publisher wanted to keep it, you know, secret. But also because it was just something I I don't know. I didn't share it with anybody. I just thought I wanted it to be complete and then I send it around. So like my dad just read it. My best friends just read it um, when it came out. Move. I know. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I don't think she read it yet. I don't think she's read it. 
because we redid our Q and A, and and uh, she, I think she's read like little bits, but to be honest, she's been working, and it's been a few days that it's been out, so it'll be a hard thing to, to read as well. Like, yeah, unless yeah. you're like doing, you know, you have a purpose. I think she's been running around, so I don't think I mean, she will read it eventually. <laughs> and just sort of talking about that. That sort of the weight, if you like, the blessing, but also the weight of the Presley legacy. How do you feel about that at this point now with this book and, and thinking about your mum and talking about her so much? I mean, I, I think it's like, of course, there, there are difficult things and great things, but like the way I choose to look at it is like, I, there are a lot of people who love the people I love, and that's really special, you know, um, who are connected to the, my family who I love. So I, I, that's that's how how it feels to me. Um, you know, it's 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 a privilege to like write a book about your parent and publish it. You know, I'm sure everybody would like, and not everybody if you have a bad relationship with your parents, but I think that everyone would love to write a book about a loved one who passed and have the world. <laughs> And share their story with everybody, you know. So it's to me, it's a privilege. Yeah, I think just by people showing up tonight, there's a huge amount of love for your mum in this room for sure. <laughs> so just to stay on the music for a moment, because again, you know, obviously people know about Elvis, they know about your mum, but your dad as well is hugely musical as well, and you know that's kind of how they first connected. What's your relationship like to listen to like your mum's music, your dad's music, and your yeah. granddad's music? I love it. Like I, well, I don't love it all the time, but I love because <laughs> it it can be emotional. But like I love there's like old recordings that my mom and dad did in the '90s, and I have those, and so that I love having that. Again, it's just like such a special, unique privilege to have songs your parents sang together. Um. um Elvis's music is depends on the song for me. If it's like a fun song, I like it. If it's emotional, it's hard. Um, just because his, you know, I think that our relationship with his music was dictated by my mom's kind of sadness and grief, and we felt her as a child. So there was like sadness, I think, there. Um, but for the most part, it's like I just feel very lucky to have all of these things. I have so much. Like, I think it's mostly people have like a few photos and a voicemail um, of their loved ones or their parents. I mean, now that there's so many photos being taken, the future generations will have a lot. <laughs> but I think that, you know, pre 2000s, you know, you have, you don't have a lot of your parents. And I just feel really lucky that I have music, you know, our house is preserved. Like that's very unique, <laughs> you know? Um, so I just, yeah, I just feel very grateful. Yeah, um, it's a remarkable legacy to have. And again, I know that people are really appreciative of, of the music that has been gifted to all of us through that. So thank you for that. Um, to talk about the audiobook briefly. So you read your voice, as you'd expect, in the audio version of this story. But you have Julia Roberts uh, embodying your mum. What was that like to listen to? Um, I'm halfway through the audiobook. Um, I haven't finished it yet. And what was really cool about it, well, firstly, I, I, I chose Julia because I had this list of um, actors and her. she felt like the most, like her voice when I thought of the way it sounded felt the most honest. Um, and then also, I just watched so many Julia Roberts films with my mom, you know? <laughs> and I think she would have gotten a kick out of that. <laughs> Your favorites that you've kind of Oh my gosh, watched. I mean, my mom loved Pretty Woman. She loved that movie. <laughs> um, she loved I, so many films of hers. Um, and, and then she said yes, which was a cool thing, too. Yeah, very cool indeed. Um, We've kind of been talking about how obviously there are different these themes of kind of like safety and danger and control and freedom. But I also wonder if there was a kind of moment where, because you had a lot of that in your childhood growing up as well, um, was there a moment where you remember that the dynamics flipped and you sort of took on more of a parental role to your mum and, and how you coped with that personally? Yeah. Yeah, that was that was um right when she became addicted to drugs. Because prior to that she was kind of like 
extremely responsible, like very like much was the captain of the ship <laughs> in our family. And then obviously when she became addicted to drugs, it was really difficult um, because the she was kind of the matriarch and the person who kind of we all went to for help and. So that was the moment I would say that it kind of turned a little and I felt my, I found myself taking care of her um, more. Um, and then as she got so you'd have been quite to, young then, so 20? I would have been about 25, yeah. yeah. Um, and it was definitely like a different, I think there's an age like where everybody like realizes their parents are not superheroes, you know? Um, and for me, I felt lucky that I made it to 25, you know, because I think that that can happen often when you're a teenager or whatever. Um, and, or perfect, I should say. I do think she was a superhero. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so it was, it was very different and, and it was hard to watch her struggle and, and have to be the person to kind of take care of everybody. Um, but, I don't know. I, she, we worked. That she got through that, you know. And then I would say that it kind of, the rest, the, our relationship after that was kind of like, um, we were equaled in a way, you know. I, I don't know. It just evolved, and it was a different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a again. I, I feel very wary because I know that you're incredibly jet lagged. So to bring up some of the very difficult things in the in the book. Um, so if I'm closing my eyes, I'm not crying. <laughs> well, I guess you are. <laughs> but there's obviously a lot in your uh, in this story about your brother as well, um, who very sadly killed himself uh, a while ago now. But I kind of brought up that question because the the thing that struck me was that when you get the call to say that he sadly has killed himself, but you know straight away that nobody's told your mum, and you're going to have to be the person to do that. And I can't imagine. How difficult that must have been it was yeah it was like horrific but i think that i my brain kind of needed something to focus on so i went right to like i have to i have to go tell my mom like that was all i could focus on um but i also knew that that would i mean it's like her worst nightmare you know i think it's every parent's worst nightmare but i just couldn't imagine a world that she would survive that you know so I, to be honest, it was such a traumatic day that it, I wasn't like in control of exactly what I was thinking about, but that was kind of where I just decided to focus, I think, to have something to focus on. And your, your brother's spirit definitely lives on so much through this book as well, but was that a very especially challenging part for you to, to listen to your mom talking about him and to try and get your own thoughts straight that you wanted to put out in the world about that? I think the most challenging part was like trying to actually put him on the page because he was so special and I kept, I, could, I didn't feel like I could really like this, because it's a book about my mom and not my brother, I felt like I had just little moments to try and um, include him and I just felt like he needs so much more than just these little moments because he was so special. So that was hard because I, I just I would write and feel like, you know, he's not coming across right and I would kind of rethink it and so it was hard because and I still don't feel like it's possible to to fully, you know, un, for him to be the, the as beautiful on you know in the book as he was in person because it's again like there's only so much I, I can talk about him and her whole story. But so I, that was challenging to try and like describe this person that I think so much of in like just these little pieces. There's, um, there's a section in the book as well, which again, you can choose to talk about or not, but I was just trying to look at, was there a tattoo that you've got that has your brother's name on it? And yeah. I don't know if you want to share that story, but or save that for people to discover in the book. Well, I think it's all over the internet, but they just, <laughs> <laughs> but I do think it's worth a read. <laughs> That was my mom's tattoo. I do have a, a tattoo with, that I got. He got a tattoo um, on the on his neck here, and then I got one after he passed, the same one. And then um, my mom's, you know, wanted a matching tattoo, 
with him as well, which you can read in the book. <laughs> I think it's, it's probably a good point to say as well that obviously the internet exists yeah. now, um, but also that I think the thing you get when you're reading the story is the full context as much as you've been able to give it from your mum's voice and your own voice and you don't get that context on yeah. the internet. No, and it's, the thing is, is that like people are always going to take out little sound bites or headlines that are you know, shocking or sound crazy or whatever. And I was fully aware that this was one of them before I put it in the book, <laughs> you know, but she wanted to tell, say it. She wanted to talk about it and, and uh, she did in her tapes. Um, and she wouldn't care, you know, she really wouldn't. So I kind of like, it is what it is and that's what happened. And so how to kind of, to talk about your brother, remember when you were growing up with him, what was he like to hang out with when you were kids? Who was like, is he the naughty one, like you were the responsible one? I know, we both went through phases of being naughty. Um, he was really sweet. Like he was, I think a lot of boys when they're young can be kind of wild and crazy. He was a little boy who was like very sensitive and sweet and like just like so cute um, and soft and smart and funny and just like, I mean, uh, we were very similar. Um, in our sense of humor and, and, and personalities. And obviously I think the other thing that the internet has particularly allowed is your mum talking about her relationship with Michael Jackson, because again, it's like, I mean, talk about your clickbait, Elvis Presley, Michael Jackson, Lisa Marie Presley. Um, there's a lot of detail about that relationship that I don't think has been spoken about before. What was that time like for you? Because you were sort of like eight, nine when they were together. And yeah. Um, I have like a really incredible memory, which has like been very um, helpful when writing this book. So I, I remember like all of it. Um, and I remember most of my life. I remember being very little. I remember them being together. I remember my parents divorced. Um, and you know, the, I don't, it, it, I don't really know what to say about it. Cause like, I, I think, I think that, um, I'm aware that my life has been very unique, but it doesn't feel out of the ordinary to me. Um, but I understand that that would make a headline. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she, again, like, read the book. I'm sure everybody here is going to do that. But uh, one of the other themes that comes up a lot is uh, the sort of loyalty that your mom had for people around her and in her, in her family, but also how that often came hand in hand with being betrayed by people. And Michael Jackson was somebody that let her down desperately, the way that it's told in, in the book. How did you feel kind of like revisiting some of those stories on that side where people were taking advantage of your mum and she, she knew it was happening because she was rich and she was Elvis's daughter? Um, well, I think with Michael, I don't think that she knew that was happening. I think, I think that there were just people around who were to say, put things, like when you when you have, when there's that level of sort of fame, there's always people around who are putting things in your head and, and trying to like divide and conquer. And that's just kind of part of the, um, the environment. I think that their marriage ended because they were both very large, uh, like alpha type people and it kind of just kind of exploded. You know, I wouldn't say that he betrayed her. Um, she never felt that way, um, but there was a lot of love there, and I think that until he passed away, when she um, would feel vulnerable, and I and she does say that she learned this from him, um, she would cut people off, and I think she did that with him, and I think not until he passed away was she able to like release whatever that was. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was an incredibly, it was just another honestly just another moment of like loss, great loss in her life. And again, it, she kind of talks about in the book being at Graceland when Elvis dies as well, but seeing people around her then, and she's like tiny at this point, but seeing people like literally grab stuff from the house and and the impact that that would have on somebody so little too. I think that she was it was very hard for her to find like genuine connections with people because of the 
the Elvis and the whatever kind of energy that brought around. Um, a lot of the time it was like, you know, people had agendas and, um, and so yeah, I think it was, that, that always broke my heart for her. Like she didn't have a lot of really great friends in her life, um, but she did have some, you know, she wasn't, she had her, her, a lot of her relationships and, and friendships were very wonderful and real too. And some, some great memories too, but some very nostalgically sad moments too. One of the bits that resonated with me was how she talks about, she would drive by her old school when she was little, um, when she moved uh, away from Graceland, but she'd drive by because there was that one time when Elvis did turn up for the parent-teacher conference and, and what that was like. And can you imagine being in that school? I know, I love that story. I think she was really excited that he was going to show up. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that that was, I guess, pretty common. <laughs> yeah, she kind of, she writes about how every so often a car would just arrive at school and take her and she'd be like, great, I get to skip school. <laughs> that would be the best bit. And uh, it's written about very beautifully, I must say. Um, so in writing this as well, uh, and then kind of knowing about what you do as a career as well, it sort of added a whole other layer. And I'm sure there are lots of Daisy Jones and the Six fans in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I actually started re-watching it because again, knowing in so much more detail now about your mum's life and her singing and the challenges of that coupled with addiction. And then you portray somebody like Daisy Jones while this is happening in your real life? Like, how are you still so, like, sane and put together? And, like... uh, um, I'm not, I'm a human. <laughs> I'm not totally put together. <laughs> um, today I am. Um, but I, Daisy Jones actually reminded me of my mom a lot. And when I read it for the first time, I, there were so many things that she had in common, like her personality was similar to my mom. Um, her life was similar to my mom's. There were a lot of similarities. Her writing, not being taken seriously, like as a writer, her, her actual, like so many things about her. And when I read it and I met with Hello Sunshine, I said like, this is my mom. Like this is um, something I know really very well. So I really think like, a, she was a lot of the inspiration for that character. Um, and then she sadly never got to see it. Um, and she knew that, I told her. I said, this, you're, you're gonna like the show because it's gonna remind you of yourself. <laughs> um, so you did get to talk to her about it, though. Yeah, yeah. she heard the, the songs. She heard the songs, but she, she um, passed away like a two months before it came out. So what was that, that whole experience must have been very challenging for you as well when that came out, because again, that was sort of, it was coupled with pandemic and everything, and yeah. so everyone felt very fragile and raw, but you had yeah. so much going on. You know, I don't know, I just keep moving, you know? <laughs> I just keep keep going, you know? I, I think that a lot of people have to walk through life experiencing grief and um, have to get up and go to work, you know? And it's just part of the, the way it works here so it was it was very hard but it, I also like loved my um, friends so much that and being around people is always nice and helpful when you're you know grieving and so I think that that doing the press with with uh, the band and Daisy Jones was actually very fun and like uplifting and, and again, I would be remiss if I didn't ask, do you think you'll be singing those songs at any point? I don't think so. Um, I think there's an audience if you want to fight. <laughs> I know, it's quite sad because we really wanted to. Um, we just... Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I love your accent. That was so cool. <laughs> So I think if you did want to re-enter If I do sing, I'll sing here. <laughs> it does seem that there's kind of something serendipitous about the way that things and opportunities have presented themselves to you that have this kind of parallel with your, with your family. 
do you kind of feel that as well? I definitely, like, I'm very open to, like, magical moments from the universe, and so I see them, you know? I think that everyone could experience them if they're open to them, but I, there's definitely, like, moments that happen where I kind of feel like there's some, something, you know, that the world is spe special. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing that's not in the book that but that I just learned recently as well is that you are a death doula as well. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what that is for people who might not know and, yeah. and why you gravitated towards that? Um, I, it's, it's really just like what a birth doula is, but for people who are dying. Um, and I gravitated towards it because when I lost my brother, I realized how little resources there were um, for people who were going to die. Um, it's just something I just I started thinking about. I think people are really uncomfortable around death until they've lost somebody, and then they're much more open to, you know, to talking about it. And for me, I'm like very open about it. Um, and I found that I had a friend who did it, and um, it was just something I was really interested in. So I just got certified. And is that something you still practice at the no, moment? No, I. It's not something I would. You know, if, I, I've only had a couple of friends ask me to help them like via phone or, or guide them to the right places for different things that they needed, but I haven't been practicing that. I, I would like to, but um, no one's asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Call me. <laughs> so I wouldn't put that out there. I think you'll be inundated with uh, <laughs> people wanting that call. Is there kind of other things, because you are open to opportunities, I'm just curious, like, what are the things you're fascinated by at the moment? What sort of avenues do you see yourself taking? Um, that's a good question. I love writing. Writing is one of my favorite things to do. Um, and singing. And singing. Um, I'll sing if when people ask me, I sing. Like, I do. Every time. <laughs> Not right now. <laughs> um, but um, if, if, if people want me to sing for things, like I'll, I will do it for sure. But um, it's not like I'm... I don't think that I would like make a record unless someone I don't know who knows you know never say never I think you just put that out in the universe <laughs> <laughs> it's open um, we do have a few audience questions that have already been submitted uh, so Stephanie asks your mum sang about going back to Graceland in Lights Out how do you feel when you go back to Graceland I feel um, it's it's very emotional because my brother and my mom and my grandfather and my great grand like oh, there's a graveyard there so that's intense <laughs> you know um, but it's also really beautiful and I feel really close to my family there so it's like bittersweet I would say the first day I usually feel like this sort of weight of you know of uh, having to visit all the graves and then once that's out of the way, then I feel really connected to my family. And do you stay in the house? Do you stay? No, um, I have, but um, no, we stay in a hotel. Okay, and then pop back to visit yeah. whenever you like. Yeah. Um, and Erin asks, has the journey of releasing this book for your mother influenced the way that you view motherhood for yourself? Um, I think motherhood was on my mind a lot when I was writing this because her, her, my mom's mothering was so, to me, um, like I, 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 she had such an instinct that I always, and still do hope that I could have. Um, so it, it's the mothering part of the book, which I hope translates a bit, is something that I, I don't know, that's on my mind a lot, I guess. You do write um, in your mother's voice that that was kind of her purpose for much of her life. She was a great mother, and, and that's what you remember and what your sisters know. Um, what, is there any particular kind of things that you can hear yourself saying? Like, obviously, your daughter's really tiny, so you can't say, put your bra on just yet. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will not. Um, no, but I do hear, like, when there... There are times when I can, it's not that I'm, I don't want to say I'm hearing her because people are going to take that out of context, but I can, I can feel what she would say to things. Like my daughter got a fever 
a really bad, her first really bad fever. And I remember like hearing her say like, it's fine, she's fine. Like 102 to three is fine. But if it's 104, like then, you know, I could like hear what she would say to me. And, and that was such a, you know, I can, sometimes I'll have her in my, in my head kind of going like, you know, brush her face, wipe her, you know, brush her teeth, brush her hair, wipe her face, like clean. She's dirty, like, it'll make her look nice. <laughs> like, she was, she would have, like, I can kind of hear things she would, like, correct, you know? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and I think you have that when your parents are alive, so it just kind of carries on forever. Yeah, yeah, for sure, absolutely. And do you, you know, we kind of, we started by talking about how you have these tapes of your mom. Do you think there's something that you'll revisit? Do you kind of try and listen to them if you're feeling like you need to hear her voice? No. Um, I just, I, ha I like having them, but now I've listened to all of them and they're just there. So I think that if I ever, I'm, there could be a moment in the future where I want to listen to her voice and I would, I would play it. But right now I've, it's all very like fresh in my mind, I think. Um, but it does feel like really special to have if I want to, you know. I realize that it's still very early days for the book and uh, you might not be able to talk about any of this anyway, but seeing as we've had an Elvis movie recently, we've had a Priscilla movie, is this something, would you like for there to be a story on the screen about your mom? Um, I mean, if somebody came along and had like a really wonderful idea that I thought was great, then yes, you know? It's hard because there's so many films about my family and it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because it feels so personal to you and then you've got other people kind of making their versions of it so it's but i you know i'm a filmmaker i respect that and, and that's kind of making movies so it's like it would have to be like the right take <laughs> can you see yourself doing something like that you know you're writing and you're directing and i don't think so it's like too close and like i don't like this was a lot to write the book and i think that um i would not direct a movie about my mom I can, that would be <laughs> a very challenging thing. I can safely say. I think. Who knows? <laughs> never say never. Never say never. Um, so another audience question. Victoria asks, if there was a moment or experience in your mum's life where you could go back and observe it firsthand yourself, what moment would you pick and why? I always think that I want to hang out with my parents in the 80s in LA. It just seems like they had really fun, a lot of fun. It, what in particular about that time? Like, I don't know, just everything. The way they dressed, like driving down Sunset Boulevard in like 80s cars and wearing like leather jackets. And I don't know, it just seems like who wouldn't want to hang out there? <laughs> so there are some people who maybe lived through the 80s that are like, yeah, I don't want to go. <laughs> I think it was more like their love story that felt so romantic to me. And, and, and uh, like that LA in the 1980s and like that moment in time. Yeah. Do you you said that your your dad's halfway through the book? No, he's he's, he's read finished it. Now. Yeah. Um, what was his feedback? He wrote me a really nice text, and um, it was like the best review I could have got because he's the, one of the only people I care about. Um, and uh, he just said, you know, it, he said I, it made me feel proud to be in this family, and I thought that was really special. Yeah. Thing. Um, from all the conversations that you've had so far since people have read some of the book or you've been doing lots of interviews is there anything about it that's particularly surprised you so far that you weren't expecting to have to talk about um, no not really I think I'm surprised at how little like I was expecting more of the clickbait like crazy stuff. And there wasn't, it, the people have been pretty respectful, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But that, so did you feel like you were kind of almost bracing yourself for that? Yes, but also I'm used to it. So it's not like a, I wasn't, wasn't going to be shocked by it. I just, I, I think I just thought there would be more of it. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that as well. Um, it is such a beautiful story, like I've so enjoyed reading it. 
which is the kind of moment that you go back to when you're looking through it that kind of makes you smile and kind of see your mum telling you about it? Um, my moments, my favorite moments yeah. in the book. Um, that's so hard. Um, it probably changes day to day. I'm it guessing. does. It does change day to day. Um, I I don't have an answer. I think that there's so many moments in it that I just. It's the moments that just feel like so her that n things nobody else would do and say, you know, those moments that I always love. Yeah, and obviously, like, you know, it's your sister's story as well, so I can imagine this has been quite an emotional time for you as a an extended family too. Yeah, um, I, I let them kind of know or, or, or ask things when they want to, and I don't really force things on them. Um, I told them about the book, they haven't read it. Um, I think it would be really intense for them. Um, but I think it'll be, when they get a little older, and maybe they're in their 20s, it'll be a really nice thing for them to have. And I'm guessing it's a similar thought, you're having it, you know, your daughter's tiny, but it, she's a good reader. <laughs> <laughs> this is not she a bedtime is. story yet, though, right? <laughs> no, no but I think that it's very cool to have so many books about your, you know, your family. Yes, for sure. Um, right, it's been such a pleasure Thank talking to you so this evening. Thank you so much for Thank sharing you your story. For